I want to give you a little bit of context of, of where I work and, and why I come up with some of the things I do. I work in a practice that has uh, orthopedic surgeons, physios, chiropractors, massage therapists, and performance coaches. So my job is really quite simple. Keep the athletes who come into me for performance training, keep them healthy, and the athletes who come into our surgical center, our physical therapy center, get them healthy. And the number one thing that I look at when I think of performance training, it's not one or the other. Performance training is simply, how do I keep people healthy? I can look at increasing their vertical jump, increasing their speed, etc. If I'm doing everything right as a practitioner, I should be taking care of A and B simultaneously. I think a lot of times in practice, though, that's not the case. One of the biggest things that's beautiful that uh, Ian just presented before me, because I'm actually going to be talking about closed drills. Closed drills based on the consi consistency of practice and repetition. To me, to keep an athlete healthy, or to bring an athlete back from injury, I don't care the developmental level. I work with uh, as young as eight years of age and as old as 65 years of age. It's all over the board. And at the end of the day, it's about being in the right position. Proper position for force production and proper position for force absorption. Those two things right there will ultimately allow us to work, one, more efficiently on the field to beat our opposition, but two, put us in less stressful positions based on our joint structures. Now, most common place, the, the, I'd say the joint that we look at in non-contact injuries, let's talk non-contact injuries right now, the area that we look at that's probably the most, the, the, the biggest cause of injury is usually the knee joint. Right? We can have soft tissue injuries, but at the end of the day, it becomes a knee joint. And the reason being is simply this. We have a foot that has a rear foot, midfoot, and a forefoot that all have triplanar motion. We've got sagittal plane, we've got frontal plane and inversion, eversion, and then we've got transverse plane with ab and adduction. However, think of it more pronation, supination with that. Then, if we look at our hip, we have the same thing. We have sagittal plane motion, frontal plane motion, and transverse plane motion. But if we look at the joint that's right in between those two areas, we look at the knee. And the knee has primarily sagittal plane motion. It has a little bit of transverse plane, but not much. So what tends to happen in sports with non-contact injuries, if I tend to go into a hard cut, and I've got great cleat wear on, I, I get stuck in my footing, I'm on field turf, I'm on a sticky surface, when my foot hits and I am not able to absorb and decelerate that force eccentrically, and my foot plants and my knee keeps going. And so those are some of the issues that we look at with non-contact injuries. We'll hear people talk about different ways, oh, that was too much shear force, that's too much compression force. The thing that we have to understand about force is it's pretty simplistic. The body absorbs force four different ways. Shear, distraction, torque, compression. If I can work on the decelerative modeling of all those forces, I make a more robust and more stable athlete. So when I look at exercise, when I look at the drills that we're gonna do today, at the end of the day, I strip the skin, I strip the muscles and say, how is the joint affected? But I need to understand this. I'm from Denver, Colorado. We have big mountains, a lot of snow, icy roads. And they've done a very good job of keeping cars on the road by putting this thing along the outside of the road to keep us from going off the mountain pass. What is that? The guardrail? Is that what keeps the car on the, on the mountain pass? No, it's the quality of the driver. The quality of the driver keeps the car on the road. The guardrail is there in case the quality of the driver diminishes or, the, or the, the environment changes and we need it. That analogy right there is how I view the neuromuscular system is the driver. The passive structures, such as ligaments, connective tissue, that's the guardrail. If the neuromuscular system is capable and can do its job, you really don't need the guardrail. It's a warm fuzzy, it's there, cool, awesome. It provides some support, I'm happy with that. But at the end of the day, if I can work on the quality of the driver, I really don't need that. So a lot of the drills we're gonna to do today, I think anytime we do an injury prevention type tasks, 
It's always single leg this, single leg that. Jump, stick, and we're always looking at the vertical component, not looking at the horizontal component from many directions. And that's what we're gonna look at today. So it's gonna start off really, really simple. Um, again, talking about force application first, wanting to do force application correctly, and then working on force absorption once we've learned those pieces. Now, just like in Ian's uh, talk, I just need three, four people. Everything we do will be truly very, very simple. Um, I will do the more difficult tasks, um, but I do need about three or four volunteers at that school. Anyone? Anyone? And if you do volunteer, bring a chair with you. Bring a chair with you, please. Okay, steal somebody's chair. You want to volunteer? Sure. <laughs> All right, see how I did that? So I honestly need the volunteers right now for context of what we're going to do. Uh, bring it, no chair? All right, we can use the box. Thank you, guys. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go back to what Ian talked about. We're going to talk about general motor skills first and foremost. So what I'm going to do so everybody can see what we're, we're about to do, I'm going to place that chair here, this chair here, and if I can get maybe one more chair, that'd be fantastic. All right, so everybody that's out here, stand next to a chair. I'm going to demonstrate from the middle chair what I want you guys to do. A couple things we have to understand. I always tell my athletes I want them to do all the right things from the wrong positions. That sounds good in theory, but at the end of the day it means teaching the correct mechanics and then allowing them to groove those mechanics, get the accumulation of workload so that they can recall when needed. When I bring an athlete back from injury or even working on the front end of an injury, I typically teach my top end speed drills first. Top end speed drills, all we're going to do is hold on to the side of a chair. You guys watch what I'm doing. I'm going to say a few uh, take home points quite a bit today. The first one is joint position dictates muscle function and posture is priority. When we're looking at soft tissue injuries, hip flexor pulls, hamstring pulls, it's not just the workload was too much. You're usually producing force in the wrong position the wrong placement, your strike was too long out in front of you, your backside recovery was too far behind you. That's why we end up having soft tissue injuries typically. Are there fatigue factors? 100%, but usually it's improper mechanics. So the first drill that we're gonna do here is a drill that I teach to my athletes, I show them, I don't explain too much on the front end, all the intricate details, but I have them start with their foot on the ground, strike the ball of the foot, Pull the heel up by the rear end and then pull through the opposite si uh, thigh. Strike the ground, pull through, reset. Now as I do this, I'm staying relaxed. For some reason, every athlete, when they think they're doing a speed drill, they want to they put as much force on the ground. It's not about that. It's about learning proper position, proper timing. So right now I want to strike. What part of the foot do we strike on when we sprint? Ball of the foot. You know how many coaches I've heard over the years and still hear that say, run on your toes. You tell an athlete to run on your toes, you're going to deal with an athlete that doesn't generate fantastic force and acceleration or top end speed, and you're going to have an athlete that's always fighting patellofemoral type syndromes or some, some sort of patellotendinosis. So I strike ball the foot in front of me or under me? Right under me. I always think about this. If I'm going to do yard work and I'm moving a wheelbarrow, do I want to push it or pull it? I want to push it. Pushing is a much more efficient mechanism instead of reaching. When our athletes tend to reach, that's when they pull. Most athletes that run on their toes and they strike fourth, fifth metatarsal, guess what they do? They pull hamstrings, typically bicep femoris. They're reaching for the ground, hitting fourth, fifth, and they're asking that hamstring at a vulnerable position of extreme lengthening to now pull this mass through. It's not a great place to be. So I teach them right first and foremost, strike under the hip, ball the foot, I'm tall on the outside leg, 
I strike and I snap up. Every time I come up, my, my tibia is about 90 degree angle, my thigh about 75 to 90 degrees, and I'm tall through the opposite hip. You'll see athletes that do these drills and they're down here. I want to get extended through the down leg. Abdominals engaged, strike, pull up and through. Ready? You guys all saw that? All right, here's what I want you to do. Work the inside leg. We'll do six repetitions on the inside leg, then we'll flip around to six repetitions on the, out, on, on the other leg. Let's, let's, uh, let's have you right here. All right, so on you, just work. Now, every time you strike, hit and hold, reset. Hit, hold, reset. When we strike, we want to make sure that we pull the toe up into dorsiflexion as we're recovering, because dorsiflexion is a fantastic mechanic to prepare us for ground strike. As we dorsiflex the foot, then switch sides after you get six. As we dorsiflex the foot, we're putting the muscles of the posterior lower leg on a stretch. Those muscles that are on a stretch now create stiffness in the ankle complex. To me, when I think about sprinting, it's not about getting plantar flexion, it's about hitting the ground with a stiff ankle complex so I can maximize my thigh and hip effort. That's the only reason. And the, the other beautiful part about dorsiflexing the foot is you can maximize the levers. What I mean by that is when we're up to our thigh position right here, is our thigh usually a long lever or a short lever relative to the low leg? The thigh is usually a long lever, right? You can tell your fastest people because they have a long, long thigh or a long tibia <coughs> and they have a short tibia. What does the short tibia allow me to do? If the long lever here allows me to generate more force around the hip axis, what does the, the, the tibia do? It allows me to get to that position quicker. So now I can leverage the characteristics of both levers to their extreme. More force, less time. To make an athlete faster, we have to produce more force in less time. But to keep an athlete healthy, we have to do these things in a certain sequence, and we've got to hit a certain part of the foot, and we've got to hit that certain part of the foot at a certain part of the ground. You guys got both sides? Okay, now face the first way. Now, every time I clap, you're gonna go through a cycle. But avoid bringing the leg down until I've called you to bring it down. Don't look at me, just listen. <coughs> Ready? Start with the leg down. Ah, uh, everybody just watch it. Start with the leg down. But you're gonna end with the leg up. Back down, start with, and then I'll call you back down every time. Down. Down, 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 and other side. Make sure I hear that ball of the foot hitting the ground. I want to hear that. Just don't lift in the hip flexion. Because what happens is you tend to denature the motor skill or the motor pattern of recovery. The motor pattern of recovery here initiates with knee flexion, not hip flexion. It initiates knee flexion, then we go to hip flexion. So make sure you hear that sound on the track. Ah, good, nice and tall, toe up for me right here. Down. Down. And rest. So the beautiful part, if I'm working with an athlete, all my athletes go through these drills. I don't care how advanced they are, how, how exceptional they think they are. I reteach them these drills because general motor skill or fundamental patterns are usually their weakest link. When I'm working an athlete coming back from an injury, whether it's an acute injury or a surgical procedure, I reteach these drills early and often because I can start reteaching the motor process. Now, we're going to start with the thigh in the up position. From here, every time I clap, we strike and pull through, strike and pull through. Keeping the trunk, the core engaged, because when I strike, I want to avoid that collapsing of the, of the spine. I want to stay engaged so I can be resilient to putting force into the ground. Ready? <laughs> Chest up, foot out in front. Good. 
Good. Switch legs. Ready. Half brace. Remember, posture dictates function. If I start changing postural position, if I change cervical position, I change thoracic position. If I change thoracic position, I start to change pelvic position. All right, now back to the first leg, but on to the chair. We'll start with the leg in the down position. Keep the core engaged, you've got to be rock solid stable right here. So now, I can work on the stability aspect of the foot. Of the foot, knee, or the foot, ankle, knee, hip joint right here, and the trunk. Hold position, and down. Now that we're not holding onto the chair, now we can actually get into our arm swing a little bit. And hold position with the arms. Oh, sorry, I didn't call you down. Down, you listen. And another leg. You can just stand where you are. Ready. Down. 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 Make sure you cycle and just don't lift up. Okay? There we go. Down. Down. So now as the athletes start to groove and understand this pattern, now I start providing the context of where these mechanics should happen. When we go to toe push off in our, in our stride, I want them to think immediately into recovery. What did I tell you just a little bit ago about soft tissue issues? <laughs> it's usually a delay of recovery or a bad placement of the foot that has us either pull something, whether it's overreaching or a delay in our backside recovery. Most adductors and hip flexor strains that you will see that are non-contact or non-weight room involved that are from running, are usually a breakdown in the backside recovery. What happens is the athlete pushes off the ground, they drift the foot back. Because somebody has told them to fully push, get triple extension, and really finish with the toe flick. As you do so, the tibia starts to flex at the knee, you start to flex at the knee joint, but as you do so, the thigh is still going back in a negative acceleration. As you do so, the rectus femoris is a two joint muscle, so I'm putting this tissue on stretch as the thigh is going back, but now as the knee starts to flex, now I've just increased that, stress, that stretch exponentially on the hip, on the rectus femoris, sartorius as well. But then, if we look at the adductors, we have three adductors that serve as hip flexors. The pectineus, the uh, adductor longus and brevis, they're all hip flexors as well. So a lot of time it's our delay in backside recovery that puts those tissues at a stressful position. So, as my athletes start to understand this pattern, now I give them context. They push off the ground. I want them to initiate heel action up to the rear end, simultaneously dorsiflexing the foot. That way I can shorten the angle of the lower leg and get faster recovery. So initiate knee flexion and then go into hip flexion. Now I've just created a sequence form, but the best thing about it is a cycle. What do we know about a cycle? If I'm laying on one side, Another side is going to sacrifice. So if I'm one of these athletes and I excessively toe push and I'm backside and I drift, my next stance or my next propulsive stance, based on timing, will be shallow hip flexion. I'm not going to get great force production out of that. Watch a 400, watch an 800, watch when the athletes start to lose it. And you'll start to see them drift backside and you'll see that the position of the thigh is nowhere near a good position for great propulsion. So we always want to work on good recovery mechanics to maintain good force throughout a, dist uh, throughout a race, but at the same time, minimize the stress on, on the soft tissue. So, all right, next drill. As they've shown me, did we go, uh, did we go without the hands? Yeah. Beautiful. So that's my early on progression. Now, we start taking it to trans mobility. Now they start to groove this pattern, they start to understand what it's supposed to look like. Now how can we replicate this into something that is a little bit more skillful, a little bit harder? So now, the first drill I'll take them through when we uh, come off the wall, working on the same cycling motion, but now I'm going to tell them to step over mid-shin. So tall, 
stepping over mid shin. This is a nice easy drill called angling. Where we, you guys come on down. Now it's your turn. Tall through the hips because posture is priority. I'm going to step up and over, up and over. Most athletes are going to do this. But I always want to maximize or work on the skill of the cyclical action. Ready? And begin. Good. Let's do it again. Do you have a track background? <laughs> Ready? I'm glad you demonstrated. Go. Beautiful. And here's a couple things that you'll see. Okay. The fastest people definitely have what? Best relative strength. And so one thing you'll see through drilling, through warm-up, through different exercises, not sprinting in itself, is you'll see a lot of dissipation of force. You'll see athletes hit the ground, they'll bounce and absorb. I'm looking for an athlete who maintains height and position. That's what she does very well. She holds position. Her cycle's pretty clean, but she holds position really well. So she's engaged and she's stable, and her foot strikes are consistent to allow her to have a consistent position of head and shoulder and hip. Let's go one more time. And go. Now I will tell you this. When I nice job. When I work with my athletes, I have not a million and one speed drills. My top end speed drills, I have three. My acceleration drills, I have three. I am not necessarily making track and field athletes. I am making athletes who are using the technical model that we know makes people faster and then blend it into their sport. Now, the drill we'll do next, now we'll take it to the next progression. We'll step over opposite knee. So pull up and through, back underneath. So now we're just going to go through a, bit, a little bit harder range of motion. Now, we're starting to increase the bite into the ground, the velocity of contraction here. And begin. Nice tall. Do me a favor. So here's the beautiful thing about drilling. What you typically see in drilling is exactly a fault that you'll see with somebody when they're actually starting to take their run. So right now I had you, you were primarily a hip flexion recovery guy, you still are. And it takes time to groove these mechanics. Ready? Go. And you all see what I'm talking about? I don't know if you guys can see it. Maybe we'll do a couple reps this way. Can you do me a, a favor? Come over here and do uh, one rep going that way. And what's your name? And John Bryant. John. John Bryant. All right, and go. You see how his mechanism of recovery is hip flexion first. And that's something, I don't know how it is uh, in your country, but in our country, when somebody's coming back from an MCL, ACL, whether it's a, a strain or an actual tear and re uh, reconstruction, we put them in braces. How is it over here? You guys brace them? Okay, so here's what happens. The mechanics, when you brace somebody, don't allow you to do what? They don't allow you to knee flex. So now, you get the recovery pattern that John Bryan shows. What's that? Ah, he did. It will change the motor skill. It blocks the initiation of recovery. So I take my athletes out, we're in a brace, and we walk. Just like this. I groove it over and over. Even though their, their position wants them in the brace, I take them out for their walking drills, have them wear it on everything else they do. And I groove that over time, because at some point in time, they're taking the brace off. And I need to make sure that we restore the proper mechanics so we do not increase our likelihood of injury on the other side. Or the same side for that. Okay, so now we start working on our step over drills. Now, you'll, you'll get this one, come on down. Now we're going to do a, a, a blending of the drills. Come here, both of you, all, all you guys can know. So we're going to start with our step over ankle. We're going to take that for the first cone, and then after that we'll go step over knee. So it's step over ankle. Once we get to the blue cone here, now it's step over knee. Ready? Good. These are very tough drills. They're doing a very good job. Let's do one more time coming back. Do me a favor, try to get a nice, gentle arm swing in with this one though as well. Try not to hold the arms rigid. Ready? Begin. Beautiful. All right. Now we start taking into drills 
that have greater velocity, greater force, but now I'm gonna, if, if I watch somebody run and I look at a movement fault, now I have specific drills that I can start implementing to help take away that problem. If I have somebody that drifts backside on the lower leg, I have the next drill, it's called a heel slide. I'll do the heel slide this way so you all can see and then I'll do it the other way as well. So tall, pull the heel up to my rear end while I'm going into hip flexion. Nice and tall, holding position. As I watch my athletes move, I change the position at which I watch. I watch frontal plane a lot of times so I can look at the posture. From ear, shoulder, hip, knee, ankle, I'll go sagittal plane so I can watch how much barium or abduction they're getting or where their foot position is when they strike the ground and or their arm action. Change your vantage point, gain perspective. Ready? Uh, you guys want to see that one more time? The heel slide? Oh, I didn't show you. So tall through the hips, pull the heel right up underneath the rear end. So I'm basically trying to smash my calf and my hamstring into each other. It's not a butt kick. I don't know why we still teach that. And it's not a high knee. It has something that has mechanical relevance. Ready? Go. Good. And on this drill, we can only, we can only do five. Five yards is fine. Now, one thing I tell my athletes is make sure that you're not concerned with your, your speed from A to B, more the repetitions, how many repetitions you're getting from A to B, without being chopped, smooth and rhythmic. Ready? And go. Beautiful. So now, we'll transition it from the heel slide to the step over. Okay? So when you guys hit the cone, now we'll take it step over. All we're doing is working backside recovery and now front side recovery and front side preparation. And begin. And he's exactly, he, you two at the end, that's exactly how I'd build a sprinter. Look how long his femurs are and look how short his tibias are. Do you uh, run track at all? Uh, yeah, you can go to Yeah, 800 maybe? Yeah, normally you'll see your, your short sprint distances built with that type of, of uh, you'll have them separated in that kind of biomechanics, bio long femur, short tibia. One more time coming back, and begin. There you go. Yeah. And one thing I'll tell you, is just exaggerate what I tell you. Okay, if I'm telling you to pull that heel up through the rim, just exaggerate. Now, all we're doing right now is working on position and force application setup. That's it. Again, minimizing the stress that we'll put on the neuromuscular system outside of our range where we want to produce our force and accelerating our recovery process on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, the front side. As I was breaking down the mechanics earlier, I, I really spent a lot of time at minimizing waste back on the back side. I don't know if I did a good job of saying what happens after that. The drills themselves showed it, but at the end of the day, once we've pushed off and I've worked on backside, now I want to get to this block, this transitional position. And from this block, I want to now start getting ready for my ground preparation, which is hip extension, knee extension simultaneously. I cue this two different ways. I'll cue it in a whipping action, where we're here, and I say whip back or bite back into the track or the ground, or I'll get to this position and I'll tell them to push straight down. Depending on the capability of my athlete and what they understand um, on the training side, their, their IQ on training. Now, taking it into deceleration. We just worked on the force application, now we're gonna work on the deceleration capability. So, we're gonna go Actually, let's go, let's go. Let's go white cone, white cone, white cone, and I'll show the drill. Watch out for the benches and the, and the, uh, we're gonna go this way towards this group, so they can see us from the frontal plane, they can see us from the saddle plane. So here's the drill. I'm gonna start in a nice easy two-point stance, sub-maximal speed. What did I say earlier? The quality of the driver is the neuromuscular system. We do a lot of our conditioning for our athletes, how? Elongation, right? Distance. 
300 yard solid speed test, yo-yo test. But at the end of the day, we need to make sure that the neuromuscular system can be ready for the start and stop of the demands of sport. So here's how we initiate it. Nice and easy. Left foot, or left leg, left leg. Left leg, left leg. Left leg, left leg. Each set, I will right now, when I'm early on teaching this, I will actually tell the athletes to touch the leg they're decelerating with so they remember what side they're doing their reps on. So that way we can balance out a rep side to side. Now, as I decelerated, what did I do? Did, did I decelerate tall? I dropped down, I absorbed. Ready? And begin. Good, don't hit the benches. Now, as I, as I decelerated back, where was my weight? Where was my weight over here when I decelerated back? It was front. It was forward. So that way I could, I could load correctly, but also put my position, myself in a position to re-accelerate. Ready? Go. Submaximal effort. When I decelerate, it's not on the toes, it's full foot. Now, there's always the argument of squatting and lunging with the knee coming forward or the toes, right? Is that an argument here? It is in the States. <laughs> the knee needs to go over the toe. If you don't go there, specific adaptations to the imposed demands. If you have not gone there and if you've not conditioned the tissue to be strong and stable, how is it to do that under the demands of sports? I have a rule though. If I'm looking at a lunge pattern or a deceleration pattern, I'll, have, I'll let them let the knee travel in front of the toe as long as the calcaneus doesn't come up off the ground. My posterior tibia, my soleus, my gastroc, my flexor digitorum, my flexor hallucis, that's their job is to stop the tibia from going forward over the midfoot. You have to train that tissue to do its job. Ready? Again. Beautiful. Nice and easy. Well done. And rest. Did you guys happen to switch legs on that one? Same leg? We have to do one more then. Sorry. You guys can see the angles. The cool thing from a frontal plane is you can see the efficiency of position at which they decelerate. You guys can pay attention to the quality of the position of the foot as they decelerate. All right, other leg. Go. Smooth, nice and easy, smooth. Submaximal. You will see when I coach, time, the infliction of my voice will determine what I want them to do. If I want a big accelerated effort, or a high decelerated effort, you'll hear. If I want a reinforced submaximal, it's just nice and easy, learn the skill you're hearing in my voice as well. Now, now we have to, how, I said earlier, the four ways that the joint structures absorb force, what is it? Or express force? What were they? Shear distraction, force, compression. Right here when we go sagittal plane, tons of shear. Decent amount of torque. Here's one thing we have to understand about the foot. When the foot hits the ground, the foot tends to flatten, right? It, it flattens unless you have something artificial keeping it from pronating. Pronation is a great thing in the foot. It's something that we absolutely want to have. But it's the eccentric control of pronation that actually controls what happens up the chain. For example, golf swing. If I'm a golfer and I'm, I'm, I'm in my backswing of, my, of a, a right-handed right uh, golfing position, as I go into a backswing, my left foot is going to pronate. My right foot supinates. So this aspect is pronation. This is something that happens when we cut into the ground. What happens when we pronate is the navicular drops toward the floor, the, the uh, talus follows the navicular, and the tibia follows the talus into internal rotation. So if I excessively adduct or pronate, the tibia is actually corkscrewing into internal rotation. If 
I don't have the strength eccentrically to control that, bad things tend to happen. When we look at like a valgus, it's not necessarily the valgus issue that's the scary part. It's the internal rotation of the vertical axis of the tibia that is the problem. So we need to make sure we strengthen up the foot, but we also work the eccentric capability of deceleration in all planes. So now, we'll get, now I'm going to put the emphasis more into the torque component. So I'm going to accelerate forward, decel. Decel, decel. Every time I do this, you guys can see my shins. They're parallel to each other, right? Most people when they do this, it's going to be out here. I'm trying to get them to learn to absorb in this pronatory stance on the outside foot. My left foot is pronated, inside edge. Inside leg, outside edge. Now I'm working the control of pronation and supination of both. Back behind, one more time. As I absorb, I drop down into it to make sure the quality of the driver doesn't rely on the guardrail. Ready. Yeah, you guys are nice and easy on your own. And begin. These are skills. The art of deceleration is a skill. Go out, all same leg. Keep your weight more inside leg. And rest. I'm going to show you guys one more time. I'll come back. I'll come for you guys. So as I accelerate forward, hitting these positions as I drop down. Okay? Ready? Begin. Other leg. Hold position. Hold position. Don't run back. Do that nice easy back leg. Back. Go. speed drills first, and then I go into acceleration. Walk this just a little bit. Now I'm going to have Claire have the weight onto the ball of the foot, not the toes. That way we get a good stretch in the, in the posterior lower leg. Head back. Right there. Now, I'm going to have Claire punch her knee forward. As she does so, I'm going to have her cast the low leg just slightly, just slightly forward. So it's not necessarily a positive chin angle of both, but she's going to cast it slightly forward. That way, when we look at top end speed, I said it was cyclical. Acceleration is now piston based. Now back down. Back up other side. And again, chest up. <laughs> back down. Every time Claire comes forward, the foot's dorsiflex and she's thinking about punching her knee forward. Now these traditional wall drills, thank you. These traditional wall drills are done all the time. But usually when I've seen them done in application up against the wall, the athletes put all their effort into driving the knee up. Earlier, I said to be faster, we had to produce more force in less time. Well, she might be getting up to a high position where she can produce a good amount of force, but it's going to be in more time. So if you saw where I kind of managed her position, was punching the knee forward with the foot barely off the ground. That way she can drive back down the ground, but she still has the setup of the shank of the femur and the tibia to, to generate great torque into the ground. So our progression is off of this, I'll just take for these, but uh, you guys might say it up here. She'll start with one leg up, and I'll just have Claire march. The whole time I'm looking to see what happens from a postural position. <coughs> Abdominals braced, and we just begin a marching tempo. 
Joint position dictates muscle function. These drills all the time, as fatigue starts to set in, the athletes tend to go into extreme thoracic <laughs> spine flexion, go into extreme thoracic spine yes. As they do so, you see the pelvis change position, and that's where we take the glute max out of position to really generate good power for us. Good chest up here. And rest. The next progression will be a one count. My progressions are simple. Fear not the man who practices 10,000 kicks. Fear the man who practices one kick 10,000 times. That's the way I look at my progressions. From here, player's gonna start the leg up. When I clap, she'll switch one time, switch one time, switch one time. I'm looking for how well she holds position, how consistent she is at her striking to the ground, what part of the foot, and where are you producing the force. In acceleration, the force has gotta be behind us. It makes me look good. I'll give player a little bit of rest. The next one we take it into is a two count. So now we have the setup. Now, usually when these are implemented, pay attention, same thing. If you're doing a wall drill, I get about 10 athletes up at one time, and I'll just look down the line. Looking down the line gives me a good indication of the angles that they're holding. However, if you're not looking from a sagittal plane view, you might be missing out on where they're getting their hip flexion from more AB duction, more TFL, more anterior gluteus medius activation or firing pattern. So now we take them into a two count. Most of the time, the athlete will short change one side just to be faster because it's a speed drill. We need to make sure that we're driving for symmetry. a confidence based on competency that I feel that they're doing the drill well. The other thing that you must keep out, in, these drills are very invasive. If you have not had an athlete that has done sprint work and you put them into a drill like this and you tell them to attack the ground, they're going to have some major doms the next day, but you also have to be smart because the angle of inclination of the tibia, or of the, uh, the angle of inclination based on the extreme dorsiflexion that we get on this. Now we take it to a three count. I would have balanced her out with another two count with the other side starting, but I'm going to spare her all the reps. Now we take it to a three count. Chest up. And rest. All right. Now, the last progression I'll take an athlete onto this is a rapid fire drill. Have them into their lean position when I say go. Going as, as long as they can holding position. I usually don't take them past five seconds on this drill. You must be smart with how you're dosing this. It's, now we take it into our progression. Just like we did with our cyclical drill, now we have to take it into a progression that forces her to really find the force application aspect. position you're not going to find it. We didn't start in an optimal lean. When you avoid starting in an optimal lean on this drill, it's very hard to find the shape position on the punch board and it's really hard to feel the force application back into the ground. So a little more lean. Trust me. Game of trust. And then go for it. When you're about to lose it, go for it. Yes. Now you feel the drive, right? 
and rest. That's what I mean by the force application has got to be in the proper direction so we get the right guys doing the job. Most of the time on these drills, I see a straight down drive. And that's when the athletes run into shin smooths and, and teletendinosis issues as well. You've got to complement the direction you want to go. If I want to go that way, I've got to push behind. If I want to stop, I've got to place in front. If I want to shuffle, I have to push away. We have to work around the center of mass with our levers. Oh, beautiful. And rest. So you can see, as she started to go, they lost tension on the lean, her torso went vertical, and her strike went more vertical, and her heel went up to her butt. Remember, we want to practice the same repetition over and over and over so we can groove this thing. We'll get one more for you, Ken. I promise you almost done. <laughs> Athletes that tend to get a lot of shin splints are your toe strikers as well. Because when I hit ball of the foot, I actually utilize the posterior lower leg in an eccentric fashion to give me that propulsion. When I hit on the toe, I drive straight down that, that tibia. Now, as the athlete starts to get those drills, now I put them in application of the drill. So I put them in, uh, give them context of what it's supposed to be like. So as I tell them to come out into a two-point sprint, I want them to exaggerate or mimic exactly what we've been working on with the wall drill and the resistive run. I put them in a two-point drill and it's punch drive. Really working on the first two steps is what I care about. I don't care about anything else because if we have a horrible first two steps, everything else is going to be catch up. I've got to set it up here, and nine times out of ten, maybe ten times out of ten, athletes are the worst at their first five yards. Because every coach has ever told them, we're going to run 30s, we're going to run 40s, we're going to run 50s. And so the athlete jogs in and then starts sprinting. So they never really worked on the skill of truly accelerating or pure acceleration mechanics. So one more time, I'll put them in position, punch, and drive. I'll just have them groove that over and over and over again. Now they're in a position. The other reason why I teach top end speed drills first versus this, it's a lot of force. It's a lot of force. Now if I've got somebody who's coming back from an acute injury or a surgical procedure, I've got to be smart in how I dose the stress to them. <laughs> I will say this, <clears throat> we need doses of venom to make our athletes tolerant to snake bite. We need doses of venom, and that means stress. And that stress is about to be progressed. All right, guys, now we're going to change this thing to multi-directional patterns. So, <clears throat> let, let's, take a, let's take a back step real quick. We, we had a hard time here with some of the deceleration drills. Would you agree? Right? Probably the first time they've done that specific task. If I have athletes that are struggling with those deceleration drills, I'll take them into an exercise called a snap down. I'm going to have you guys all do. We're going to start with our feet on the line. You're going to reach up. When I clap, they're going to drop and stick. Bilateral. Ready? Reach up. Drive the arms back and stick on the brakes. Reach up. Toes. Again, reach up. Get up high on the toes. Teaching them how to put on the brakes in a bilateral decelerated knee. One more time. And, and again, you can pay attention to foot position. What do we know about excessive abducted uh, forefoot? Is that extra rotation? I will argue you. And I'll say it's internal rotation. I'll say it's external rotation of the forefoot and the phalanges, but I'll tell you it's internal rotation of the tibia. Now, if somebody's extremely barren, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's external rotation. But in that case, that's internal rotation because the tibial tuberosity is actually going in. So we have to pay attention to those things. Because that creates that exception. You tell people, oh, don't mind in your stance. But if, if it's not a barren based stance, it's more of a pronate stance, that's excessive internal rotation of, of that tibia. Now we take it into a single leg. So now I reach up. And I put on the brakes each and every time. My front foot, my, my deceleration foot is flat. It's not toes, it's flat footed. Ready, reach up. 
Step it back. When we hit, everything's got to engage. Right? It's not just hit and clap. When I hit, everything sticks. Ready? Back up. And rest. Other leg. Ready? Good. I, I, I'm okay with your torso angle. Just sit back just a little bit with your, your, your torso. And rest. Cool. Now, they're showing me that they can control this stuff, doing a great job. Now I'll put them in a position right here. When I clap, stick. Clap, stick. And if they have the double clutch on their landing, I'm fine with it. I'd rather that than this. So one more time. In a loaded position, it's sub-maximal. It doesn't have to be as much force as I'm putting through. It's push, stick. I'm going at an oblique angle now. So now, I'm starting to blend that combination of, of, of maximal shear, maximal torque. Now I'm blending it at more of an oblique, oblique angle. So let's go to our right. Not a maximal effort, but try to make your stick on the, on the landing. Ready? And back. Ready. Let's go. Ready? So, uh, balance. Not, not together, but balance. Ready? And back. A little bit harder, right? One more time, going to our right. Ready? All right, now we go to our left. Ready? Athletic position. Okay. Off the back. When do these when do non-contact like ligamentous injuries happen? What's that? When do non-contact ligamentous injuries happen? The eccentric phase under fatigue. Guess when I do these exercises, particularly these? When they're outside the teaching room where my athletes have already learned them and done them? Post-session. They may have just done a hard metabolic session. Legs are gone. Now I'm going to make them have to decelerate. Ready? Doses of better. One more time. Good. As you can see, we, we, look, we're all in the industry. We're all in the industry. These are tough things to do. But there are skills that I would say is worth practicing. Now we're going to go straight lateral. So you can load up, push, stick. Load up, push, stick. We're going to go to our right. And load up. Good. And you'll see we want to fight that neutral foot. We want to find that neutral positioning. Not too much internal, not too much on the outside of the foot. Find neutral. Ready. One more time. back the other direction. Now going to our left. Right foot pushes off the inside edge. Ready. And go. But we want to make sure that we load up, that we're not here knee flights, we're loaded up here. Ready. And rest. And the last one that I'll do in the progression, I'll put them in the single leg position, then I'll have them turn the stick. I won't have it. Uh, if you guys feel like you can do it, let's do it. So single leg position, turn and stick, about 135 degree angle here. So I went oblique at about 45, I went 90, now 135. And that double clutch landing, I'd rather see that than the, the tight wire act. Ready. And back. One more time. Now you can see a lot of inability to control rotation, right? Ready? Yeah, that's still 135. Too powerful. Too powerful. Now we go the other direction. Ready? There we go. That's it. That's a better Again. 
butt back when we go to decelerate and that sagittal plane, we've got to drop our butt back. <coughs> Otherwise, you really maximize the shift in the knee. All right, we can get up right. Clay, let's get uh, one rep over here. Same thing, decelerate, and then shuffle. Ready? Go. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, so you guys get the idea. Then we can extrapolate this off to a drill where now we actually do a single leg pivot like we would in sport. A single leg it could be like a drop step. I call these a lead in. So I'm going to start at this cone. I'm going to run sub maximally for the white cone. Nice and easy. I'm going to plant and then sell out. But as I plant, notice what I did. <laughs> nice and easy into this cone. Drop the hip. Position the foot back to what Claire's been showing us all afternoon, the acceleration action. Cool? Who wants to do it? Anyone? Anyone? Alright. Weren't you and Dave's talk earlier? Everybody can do it. Nice and easy, okay? Angle. Aha! Oh, love it. So, that right there is exactly what 10 out of 10 athletes do when they change direction. Did you see what you did? Mark? Did you see what he did? He came out and he started going to his top end speed mechanics. When we transition, when we, when we transition, it's punch drive, just like the acceleration pattern. Yeah, thank you. That's where you'll see a lot of hamstring strains as well. Because what do cleats allow us to do? Have terrible mechanics. They allow us to get away with things that we should not be able to get away with because of the bite of the cleat into the ground. However, if you bite into the ground and then pull up, it's a pretty hard single legged hamstring drill. So you can get a lot of hamstring strength just off a, a transition like that. Thought you want to give this a shot? And you have to be careful on that next step that it's not overreach. It's hit here, but it's very easy to go heel strike overreach. What part of the foot do we want to hit off of in acceleration? The ball foot, not the heel. But that was a great job of, of uh, transition. You guys, let's get one more and then I'll go to the next drill. more coordinated, I, I don't think is ever a bad, bad idea. Give them all the tools. Because the way I look at it is I never give my athletes an absolute of how they should move. I just give them a drop, drop down menu of options. So now we can do another deceleration drill. Accelerate, decelerate, drop, accelerate. So every part of the drill, I'm putting in a deceleration emphasis. Again, that's the issue. That's the skill that I feel is never taught enough, is deceleration. Then we can also take it into crossover drills. Maybe more like a midfield play. We have athletes that, that tend to go back and forth between the offensive and defensive positioning. You, you make the drill. Just understand the general guidelines or the framework and then use your imagination to build the drill based on the individual's position. So now, we've got about 15 minutes. Is that right? Now we're going to go into how I introduce plyometrics. Because I think that's, from an injury prevention standpoint, that's probably one of the biggest things that people will use for uh, prevention strategies. Now, So, first off, I start in setup. If you don't start in a good position, you're not going to find a good position. We always understand that the quality of the landing is going to be the outcome of the next overcoming phase if we're doing a multiple response plyo. So let's teach it early and often. So here's my progression. <laughs> Full foot and landing. I don't care about hip extension. I care about position and landing. Sticking each and every time. 
working on that, putting on the brakes. Ready? Ready, so make sure. Start here when you hear my clap. Ready. Put a little bit more forward. Right foot? Good board. Yeah. No, no, not forward. Forward in rotation. Ready. Just a little flick from the ankles. I don't need much. Beautiful. Okay, shake it out. Next progression. It's going to get tricky. Sticking each and every time. Low amplitude. Ready. We're going to go three down to our left, three back to our right. Ready. Get your arms going back before you jump. So, here, and then they help you through. Yeah. And you guys can watch. <laughs> did you miss one or did I? <laughs> we did three. We did three. I see, I touched you. And let's go back to our right. Stick that landing. And we want to make sure that we're landing in a good position. Again, like we talked about with Mark, we know with Mark, we've seen it. If he gets too wide, he starts to abduct the forefoot. I'm telling you, when you abduct the forefoot, the tibia is internally rotating. Particularly if you're excessively pronating at the foot. All right, now the next progression is now transverse plane. So I did sagittal frontal, now transverse plane. So it's stick. Quarter turn. Every time I'm here, I'm turning everything on. It's just not my legs. It's the trunk, it's the hips, it's everything. Ready. <laughs> Look at Mark's right foot, right? Keep showing us. And rest. Now, this is another way I'll condition my athletes at the end of a session. I'll put them down 30, 45 seconds and have them stick in the whole position like that. Again, you've got to give that tissue the specific endurance. Particularly those, those ranges. We say that those, those injuries happen in fatigue. Well, why? In athletics, when we get tired, do you think we still play with the same bend? <coughs> no. We start to play up. We start to play up. When we play up, we lose option of absorption. So we've got to condition them to be able to hold position. Next progression, now we go tall. And stick. Now I do care about hip extension. However, if my quality of landing was not good and my low amplitude jump, am I going to take them there? Absolutely not. Let's just get two jumps. Make sure we actually, and one thing, get the arm swing too. I think that's just a, a good part of the skill. Make sure if you're up, you're down, you're back up. The arms help you go vertical. Oh, I did say two. Next progression. Now we take the same thing. Frontal plank. Start down. Balanced on my landing. How consistent this is my foot placement every time I land. If you don't feel comfortable um, going more massive effort, don't. Now, what, where, what part of the foot are we landing? The ball on the heel. I always say full foot. If you say toes, then they don't absorb it. If you tell the athletes land softer, the first thing the athlete tends to think of is land on the toes. When they land on the toes, they don't get into the good mechanical position to get the, the hamstrings and the glutes and the quads Doing the job is to do the angles of the end of the accelerator. Ready? Let's start tall. And one more time. Tall. Good, now let's take it back the other way. I narrow up your stance just a hair on the landing. Ready? And I would, and now with you, with as much play as you get the feet, I would definitely tell you not to maximum jump on these. One more time. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, last, last one in the progression. Now it's... Again, I don't necessarily 
necessarily care about how much oomph. I care about when you hit, can you put on the brakes again? Not put on the brakes here. That's not going to help. You ready? Go to your right, quarter turn. Paul. Good, make sure you get your butt back on that landing. You've got to absorb through these guys. Ready? Beautiful. How legs go? Get a little smoke? Don't have to work out? Yeah. All right. Last series, I'm going to take, I'm going to do two more series and I'll, I'll demo those. So the two more series I'm going to show, this is another conditioning strategy I'll do at the end of the session. If it's been a multi-directional day and I want to put a little bit more volume on them, but I want to teach them the art of deceleration over and over, I'll do a series of the pushes like we did. They have to stay down. They can't get up and out of it. They've got to hold position. As they show me great competency in that, it's push, push, push back, push, push, push back. So I'm constantly working on that theme of single leg decel. Then the very last one, it's push, 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 stick. So now I'm putting together all those qualities of stress, shear, compression, distraction, and torque all within really a controlled manner. But not just hoping that they do enough deceleration in their sport, balanced, that we create an adaptation of integrity or a more robust, robust athlete, but giving them actual accumulation of stress so I can give them the doses of venom. Last drill I tend to end the last session with is uh, typically barefooted. It's a single foot hop. It's here. They can't go forward until they've stuck. Double clutch landing. They show me they can do that well. Now it's a two count. They show me they can do a two count. Now I go a three count. Now, my hops on this are not linear. They're oblique again. That's gonna be more the position. I'm gonna have to absorb portion of cutting in sport. But now, I can add more speed, more velocity to the drill and force them to put on the brakes. All right, lots of info, lots of progression. The progression started at teaching. Every aspect that I went through today is started at teaching submaximal. It goes down to the quality of movement. What do we do in the weight room? We saw it in the earlier lecture. We start with a dowel, right? We start adding load, one's technique is pretty darn good. However, our athletes are gonna play sport. They're gonna continue to move. They're not gonna like <laughs> not play. We don't want them to, but we have to implement some of these fundamental strategies in a condensed manner that they get enough accumulation to have an adaptative response to it, right? Stimulate, accumulate, restorate, adaptate. Cool. Any questions? All right. Yes, sir. So, like, obviously, Ian was showing us um, this is this is you need people to be able to do this, then to be made more adaptable. Ian was doing earlier. I know. This is very like uh, structured. This is very close, very structured. Yeah. But to Ian's point, I don't believe that they live in separate worlds. They're integrated. So just as I'll do our random practice, we'll end or start a session with this stuff. This is almost like our movement prep. And then we get into more of our randomized activity. But you need, you need certain people at a certain level doing certain things, obviously. Like, you know, when you come go back from ACL, what you're doing here, yeah. you want them doing all that before they go out and start doing. Oh, things. for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, they've got to live in a pretty closed world when we're coming back from that injury. Um, one, the biggest thing that you're always looking at whether you're implementing linear tactics, multi-directional tactics, is you've got to look at bilateral symmetry. If there's not bilateral symmetry, man, they're not ready to go. I saw another hand over here. Yes? Do you teach uh, your athletes to accelerate from a landing? 
so at what point? Uh, like from a jump? Yeah, and then you jump <coughs> and it's like, You know, they're going to do it all the time, right, in sport. They're going to jump, hop, stick. But it, if I'm doing like closed drills and, and uh, you know, I'll sometimes do that single-legged hop, stick, and then go. I'll do a two-footed like reactive drop and then go. Like I'll change it up. But I, I early on with the youth athletes, I, I want to have random and fun. But if you give them too, I feel if you give them too many variables, then they tend to not get good at any of them. So I like to control and groove and then let go. Just like I said, I'll have it at the beginning of my practice. But it's very, here's my syllabus. And then, okay, now here we've got some random movement, some reactive type work as well. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, just on one of the, the shuffle kind of drills you're doing, you have really excellent angles. So you're running in, and you, you had a real, really good 60 degree angle there. Most people, like, I was just, how do you get the upper body correct on that? Because most people, when they'll, they'll go into that shuffle position, they'll plant. The upper body will nearly shoot forward as you break around the hip. Uh -huh. What are you doing to, to teach or correct? Or I'm probably preparing on the front end. So I'm, I'm telling them as they go into that, to start turning the body as they get into it. Does that make sense? Almost like you would on a, a beep test, how you would prepare for that line. You would, you would set up and you would start to turn the upper body at the same time as the lower half. It's not, it's not <coughs> core drill, the correct thing. I think it comes back to specific adaptations to the opposed demands. I mean, yeah, the stronger you are, but if you don't understand context of bracing and holding position, like I'll do some drills, uh, don't let me push over. Right there. I'll just do a drill like that where he has to feel himself engaged against like a front of plane type force. And that way, you know, say, hey, when you go into that cut or that touch, you know, stay engaged, stay braced. But it's, it's not, I don't want to make it too mechanical either though. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's an awareness thing to take that just, so as Ian said, it's movement's evolution in time. And you know, one thing that um, you know, it really wasn't the scope of this lecture, but all my movement, I start with so much skipping patterns. Just to teach the athlete rhythm and coordination, tempo. Yes, sir. One more. One hundred percent. I put it into the warm up. I have the unique perspective in my where I what I do that I can make it a full session. I'm not the skills coach, um, and I've got free time with them. I could see my athletes for you know two times a day if I needed to. However, what I would do is is pick some of those linear drills, have that be a part of your warm up, one day. Pick some of those multi directional drills, have that be part of your warm up. Have some of those jump landing progressions, have that be part of your cool down or part of your, your ending uh, component of your session. Yeah, I would just put in like 10, 15 minutes, yeah, ending just like, it doesn't have to be 100 contacts, just enough to groove that pattern under a little bit of fatigue as well. Make sure that they've learned it first on the front end before you use it in that strategy. But, um, I mean, that's, I would just find 10, 15 minutes where you can implement it. You guys were awesome, thank you very much.